Uh, it is sometimes said that we save the best to last. Well, this wasn't done on purpose, but I'm sure after this evening's presentation, you may believe that it was. Over the course of our three years, there haven't been many speakers or topics that have been brought to our attention as many times as Father Daniel Horan, a Franciscan friar and Catholic priest. He's a graduate of St. Bonaventure University and studied for his Master of Arts in Systematic Theology and a Master's of Divinity at the Washington Theological Union. He earned his doctorate in philosophy and systematic theology from Boston College. Father Horan's accomplishments are many too many in number to mention, but he's currently the Director of Spirituality and Professor of Philosophy, Religious Studies and Theology at St. Mary's College, Notre Dame, Indiana. He serves on the Board of Trustees at St. Bonaventure University and the Board of Regents of the Franciscan School of Theology. As well, he has served for many terms on the International Thomas Merton Society Board of Directors and held the Dun Scotus Chair, Chair of Spirituality at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. Father Horan speaks internationally on the theological and social significance of the work of Thomas Merton, as well as the intersection of the millennial generation and spirituality. He's a prolific writer, a former columnist for America, a columnist for the National Catholic Reporter, and has offered 14 books. He's the recipient of numerous awards for his writing and is the co-host of the Francis Effect podcast, exploring politics and current events through the lens of Catholic teaching and spirituality. Being in awe after reading two of his thought-provoking articles in the National Catholic Recorder, I hope you will have the same reaction too. Do you really believe in the Holy Spirit? Remembering the Forgotten Person of the Trinity. Please join me in welcoming Father Dan Horan. Thank you so much, Mary Lou. It's it's really a joy to be with you all. Thank you for uh, welcoming, welcoming me to St. Jude. Uh, for being a part of this series. Uh, again, thanks to, to Mary Lou for the coordination, to Andy for his his tech brilliance and wizardry behind the scenes, uh, to Donna Nora Fisher, um, to Monsignor John, Father Joe, and Father Brendan, and, and all of you uh, parishioners and friends, and maybe folks may, who may be new to uh, to the community, but um, I'm delighted to be with you and to join you from uh, South Bend, Indiana. I had mentioned before we went live here how much I love Pittsburgh. It's a wonderful uh, city. I'm trying to think the last time I was there was to celebrate the wedding of my college roommate's sister. So um, lots of great memories in, in such a lovely, uh, lovely city where, where the rivers meet. Um, so I have, I understand about 40 minutes and, uh, I'm going to, I have so much to say. This is a professional hazard. Have as much time as you'd like. To. <laughs> That's a dangerous offer, Mary Lou. It's a very dangerous offer. I was just about to say that it's a, a professional hazard to twice over when you have, um, a religious who's ordained to preach as, as a, as a presbyter, as a priest combined with, um, a friar who also happens to be a professor who teaches and is used to just hearing himself talk for for long periods of time on end. So when you combine those things together, it's a it's a dangerous uh, recipe. But I hope to keep your interest, and I'm sharing my screen now. I hope folks can see this. Okay. Um, my my intention is to share some reflections on the Holy Spirit, and to get us to reflect on this question together about whether or not. We individually or we collectively as, as the people of God, that is the church, do we really believe in the Holy Spirit? And if it, it may strike you as a bit of a provocative title, that's intentional. So I don't mean to scandalize anybody, but to invite a, 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 a kind of spirit of reflection, a, a spirit of discernment. We're very quickly approaching Holy Week and the Holy Triduum. And so as we reflect on... Um, you know, the the Easter, the great Easter vigil that is, believe it or not, almost a week away. Ah, I can't wrap my head around that. Um, when we renew our baptismal promises and we welcome others into our faith through baptism and confirmation and, and first Eucharist, when we are asked, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Maybe we'll think about our response just slightly differently in a week's time. And I hope this evening will encourage all of us to do that, to be more mindful. So um, I want to begin first by saying, you know, why the Holy Spirit? Why are we talking about the Holy Spirit? Or maybe to put, to make it a bit more personal, why, why am I so interested in the Holy Spirit? 
on the one hand, as I mentioned with the creed and our renewal of baptismal promises, we, most Christians, I should say all Christians, if put on the spot, would say they believe in the Holy Spirit. I, I think that is true. And I don't think people are lying at the Easter vigil when they're asked and they say, you know, with, with boldness, I do believe. But I have wondered in my own life and in the life of uh, many people that I've accompanied in ministry and, and through education, uh, people that um, even religious and, and the ordained and people who are uh, professional pastoral ministers, I wonder sometimes how often we really do think of the Holy Spirit. And my guess is that more often than not, the Holy Spirit is, as the subtitle of tonight's presentation suggests, the forgotten person of the Trinity, the proverbial third wheel, you know, the kind of two is nice, three makes a crowd, right? And, and the Holy Spirit is the one who often gets left off. I also want to share with you from, from the outset a passage that comes to us from the Second Vatican Council. And this is, whenever I think of the Holy Spirit, I think of this passage. So the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s issued the highest teaching, of course, uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. The highest teaching is that which is uh, promulgated by an ecumenical council. And in the council's document about the church itself, in Latin, it's called Lumen Gentium, or the light of all nations. It is the document on what does it mean to be church. And in the, verse, in the first chapter, in, in paragraph 13, we hear this line. It follows that though there are many nations, there is but one people of God, which takes its citizens from every race, from every people, making them citizens of a kingdom which is of a heavenly rather than an earthly nature. And then it's this line. All the faithful, scattered though they be throughout the world, are in communion with each other in the Holy Spirit. So that one who dwells in Rome knows that the people of India is that person's member, since the kingdom of Christ is not of this world. That line, all the faithful scattered though they are throughout the world, are in communion with one another in the Holy Spirit is also, if, if you've never heard that line from the Second Vatican Council, may be familiar to you from Eucharistic Prayer 3 in, in our liturgy where there's that same sort of invocation of the Spirit, that scattered though we are throughout the world, we are united to one another in the Spirit. And so I think the Spirit is, is uh, an important focal point for Christians, for Catholic Christians especially, to reflect on, because I don't think the Spirit gets as much attention as the Spirit deserves. More on that in a minute. Let me start also by saying, who is the Holy Spirit? <laughs> When we get that question in the creed, it may seem obvious at first that we're talking about the third person of the Holy Trinity. We're talking about God. So the Spirit is first and foremost God, as divine as the Son, as divine as the Father, the Creator. The Spirit um, is, is oftentimes understood going back to the earliest centuries of the Christian tradition, of the earliest Christian theologians, and into the writings of St. Paul himself. The Spirit is understood as the symbol of divine imminence which is kind of a clunky or fancy way of saying that the Spirit is the way that God draws near to creation from the very beginning of God's desire to create through the present moment and into the future. I love a line that St. Augustine in the fourth century said, that God is the one who is closer to us than we are to ourselves, that God knows us so well as if to draw near closer than we, can, than we are even in our bodily form to our own experience of ourselves. And in that divine imminence, that that divine closeness to us. It is the spirit that St. Augustine is talking about. St. Augustine also highlights, like St. Paul does in his letters, that the spirit is also what we mean first and foremost by grace. It's the gift of God's very self to us. The spirit is also the founder of the church at, at Pentecost, right, which will celebrate those 50 days after Easter. So, if Lent seemed to come and go very quickly and Holy Week is just around the corner, Pentecost, I'm afraid, is just, just a little bit further on the horizon, we'll, but we'll be here soon enough. That the Spirit is the one who forms the church. And as we had in that line from the Second Vatican Council, it is the Spirit through our baptism that unites all of us, scattered as we are in all of our varied places and locations. I begin there because when I think of the Holy Spirit, that's the first thing that comes to mind. It is what grounds our theology of what we call the communion of saints. And when I talk about that, I don't mean just the capital S saints, you know, the St. Francis's or the St. Clair of Assisi or the St. Catherine of Siena. We're talking here about all the saints, as St. Paul says, with lowercase s, which he means all the baptized. So it is the spirit that unites us even when we are physically apart, even when earthly death separates us. 
we continue to be united to one another through the presence of God drawing near to us as grace, which we call the Holy Spirit. The last thing I want to say before I kind of get into some more reflections about the Holy Spirit is um, the structure of my remarks for this evening. And, and, and I'm drawing here from the wisdom of Pope St. John the Twenty-Third. He called, as you may recall, the, the Second Vatican Council in 1958. Uh, the first session took place in 1962. And in 1961, Pope John the Twenty-Third issued an encyclical letter, a teaching for the whole church called Mater et Magistra, its mother and teacher. And he was reflecting on the church itself. And one of the things that he reflects on in the encyclical is how do we take the principles, what it is we say we believe, whether that's the creed, whether that's an aspect of our Catholic moral tradition or Catholic social tradition, whether that's some aspect of, um, of a principle that, that we are, are trying to practice as people who follow the gospel, how do we take those principles, these ideas of our faith, and put them into practice? And what John the 23rd says is he says there are three stages, three steps, as it were, which should normally be followed in what he calls the reduction of social principles into practice, taking these ideas and putting them really, you know, into practice. He says, first, one reviews the concrete situation. Secondly, one forms a judgment on it in light of the same principles. And then thirdly, one decides what in the circumstances can and should be done to implement those principles. In other words, we say, what is it that we say we believe? What are these core principles? We need to look at the world around us and in light of those same principles, make sense of what's going on. We form a judgment or a view or a decision. And then we put those principles into action, into practice. Pope John the 23rd continues. He says, these are the three stages that are usually expressed in the terms, look, judge, and act. And it's that framework that I'm going to use tonight in the time that I have to reflect with you. I want to suggest that we are going to look or see first. And I want to talk about something I like to call Holy Spirit atheism. So stay tuned, buckle your seatbelts. The second thing we're going to look at is that stage of judgment or interpretation. Judgment sometimes can seem kind of harsh, right? As if we're expressing a kind of judgmental view. What John the 23rd is saying here is how do we make sense? How do we interpret? And what I want to suggest here is that we can draw from our tradition, our Christian tradition, to get to know the Holy Spirit better. So what are some ways that we can do that to interpret um, what it is we say we believe? And then finally, that action, what, what does it mean to see and recognize the presence of the Spirit, interpret our situation in light of God's closeness, God's imminence to us, and then put that understanding, that belief, that judgment into practice? And I'm calling this set of reflections, being led by the Spirit, renewing the face of the earth. More on that as we go. And then with our remaining time, uh, I'm, I'm most looking forward actually to interacting with you all through through your questions and through your comments, through your observations, through your insults, whatever it is you send to Dr. Don Fisher, who's going to facilitate that Q&A at the end. Let's let's move forward and, and take a look at what I like to call Holy Spirit atheism, which may be a bit jarring to, to some. In order to reflect on this, I want to go back to um, one of my favorite uh, theologians, and this takes a lot for a Franciscan friar to give a shout out to a Jesuit theologian. So you know he's good if the Franciscans are saying positive things. But uh, this picture here is of uh, Father Karl Rahner, um, a German theologian, a German Jesuit priest um, who was one of the leading theological advisors to the bishops at the Second Vatican Council. The Latin term for that is, is he was a paritas, uh, an advisor, an expert, a theological expert. And he was by far one of the most influential theologians, not only at the Second Vatican Council, but in the 20th century um, worldwide. He said something in, in 1967. He wrote a little uh, book on the Trinity. Um, and in it, he makes this observation very early on. And I want to quote it to us here. He says, Christians are in their practical life almost mere monotheists. He goes on and says, we must be willing to admit that should the doctrine of the Trinity have to be dropped as false, the, ma the major part of religious literature could well remain virtually unchanged. What he's getting at here is that as Christians, one of the most central elements of our faith, one of the core things we believe in is that God is triune. God is one and somehow three. God is creator. God is sanctifier. God is savior, right? The word incarnate, Jesus Christ. And yet, he says, kind of, you know, in almost a really provocative way, that 
when you look at the way people talk about God, when you look at the way that Christians talk about their faith, it's very hard to recognize this triune sense of God present in that reflection. And his provocative statement suggests that if for some reason, let's say um, there was some divine revelation or, or some kind of discovery and Pope Francis comes out tomorrow and says, actually, there isn't a Trinity. It's actually just two persons of, of the divine nature. Um, Rahner's point is like, well, actually, that wouldn't require a whole lot of revision or a whole lot of reflection because practically speaking, he says, most Christians operate as mere monotheists. So we kind of think about God oftentimes in one category or another. So we say we think about God as creator or God as father. We think about God as son, as, as the word incarnate in Jesus Christ. Or we think about the Holy Spirit, which I hope is the main focus this evening. But we we don't often take into consideration all the members of the Trinity. We 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 forget, as it were, the essential nature of how God has revealed God's self to us. The reason I start there is because when we think about the Trinity, I think the invitation that that Father Carl Rahner invites us to is to reflect on how is it that we understand God? Who do we think of when we think about God? There are, you know, all sorts of stereotypes, of course. Um, you can think about the uh, the old man with the beard, a father time like character up in the clouds. Right. Or you might think of Jesus. You know, Jesus is very easy to kind of call to mind. Or you might think of the Holy Spirit as a dove or as a, a flame or some other image. But this idea of thinking about God's oneness and God's triune nature at the same time, the three persons, is really important. And he makes this point that we shouldn't underestimate its significance. So in light of that, one of the things I've found myself reflecting on over the years is that if there was to be a forgotten member of the Trinity, that member of the Trinity, that person of the divine Trinity would probably be the Holy Spirit. And that's for a number of reasons. The Holy Spirit continues to be forgotten because I think on the one hand, the Holy Spirit is the hardest to imagine. I'll say more about this in a minute. But when you think about the images or metaphors we have for spirit, it's really hard to wrap our heads around, or we come up with kind of superficial images that are easy to dismiss or that we caricature. So the spirit can be difficult for us to think about. I also believe, and this is where the Holy Spirit atheism comes in, that in a very practical way, a lot of Christians, including those who are ministers like myself and church leaders like bishops and pastors and women and men religious and lay pastoral ministers and ordinary Christians alike, oftentimes exercise a way of being in the world, a way of being Christian that does not reflect a strong belief in the, in the existence of the Holy Spirit. We may give lip service to that creed, right? Every Sunday we stand up and we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. We get into autopilot mode, perhaps. And like I said, Easter vigil, Easter Sunday morning, we'll say, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? And we say, I do. But do we act that way? Or is the Holy Spirit an unwitting, forgotten member of the Holy Trinity? One of the ways I think we can see the, the, the Holy Spirit kind of falling off the radar of a lot of Christians and a lot of members of the church more broadly is in this question, who is really in charge of the church? Now, I find this with students sometimes, you know, there's, we're so used, especially in the modern world, to kind of corporate structures, right? Nonprofit and for-profit corporations. You have CEOs and CFOs and COOs and boards of directors. You might imagine that the church is like that. The first CEO of the church is Jesus Christ, Esquire, right? And then you had the senior vice president, St. Peter. And then you had the board of directors, the apostles, and go on and go on and go on. And that may seem kind of silly, but I think there's an everyday understanding that that's actually 2,000 years later, how the church operates. Pope Francis is the CEO and president. You have the cardinals who are the board of directors and, and the kind of C-suite level people. And then you kind of have a structure, a flow chart, an org chart that flows from that. But it's important for us to remember that actually the church is established by God, that it is commissioned by Christ, that it is run by the Spirit. The Spirit, remember what Lumen Gentium says, is the one who unites all the baptized, scattered though we are throughout the world, unites us in communion. The reason I'm, I'm starting here this evening is because when I use a term like Holy Spirit atheism, I mean it kind of in a, in a soft sense. I'm not calling people 
true atheists, people who are maybe hostile to faith or, or deny the existence of God altogether, but that in our practice, in the way that we think, in the way that we act in the world all too often, reflects that we don't believe that the spirit is actually in charge of the church. Too often, I think, Christians individually and Christian leaders in particular exhibit a kind of hubris, a belief that it's all up to us, that if, that if we don't do this, we don't take control, we aren't in charge, we don't make the ultimate say, we don't do things as we individually think is best, then it's all going to fall apart. And we see this in so many ways, at times painful ways, devastating ways. I would say, for instance, and this is part of that seeing, remember the see, judge, act model, the seeing, if we look at the state of our faith community today, locally and more broadly, we see signs that maybe people don't believe that the Holy Spirit is really in charge of the church. So I hear this expression sometimes, right, particularly around who has access to the sacraments, who might be permitted to come and receive Holy Communion, or who might be allowed to be married in our church? You know, are you a parishioner? Did you, did you give, you know, do you get envelopes in this parish? Did you, you know, put money in the second collection? Did you go to pre-Cana? All the kinds of layers that we build up. Some of them rather hostile too, right? Denying people communion, denying couples the ability to have their child baptized in the church, right? Sometimes these are extreme examples. Oftentimes what I hear in response is, well, we have to be very vigilant about who we invite or allow to come to the table of the Lord's Supper because we need to protect God. We need to protect the sanctity of the Holy Eucharist. We need to protect Christ without thinking for a moment of the absurdity of this statement. What kind of God do we imagine? What kind of God do we believe in that would require our protection? When I look to the Gospels, what do we see in every single instance but Jesus, God incarnate, right? The one who sends the spirit, the paraclete, the aid, the assister. What does, what does Christ do? Always welcomes people, even those who are viewed as unworthy or at the margins, unacceptable, who may not you know, be the, the, the ones expected to be part of uh, the in crowd or uh, the, the community that would be closest to a, a religious leader and a prophet like Jesus, who is God incarnate. I think we see the same thing in, in the egregious ways that there has been sexual abuse cover-up in the church. And I'm sorry to bring up such a heavy topic, but as John the 23rd challenges us, calls us to see the reality as it is, we might ask ourselves, what leads to this thinking that religious superiors and church leaders felt the need to not report horrible crimes and sins and evil, to cover these things up as we sadly know all too well. And I know you and Pittsburgh know well, especially after the grand uh, the, 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 the report that came out by the grand jury in 2018. One of the things that I see in instances like this is you often heard time and again in private correspondence that has been made public, but also even in statements that were made by church leaders, that there was fear of scandal, fear of perception of the church, fear that people would be kind of offended and walk away if they knew the truth. And that idea, I think, is rested on the fact that they felt that they were in charge. If they had actually done what was probably just and right and legally ob obliged, then everything would fall apart in their eyes. It's a hubris. It's a sense that they're the only ones who are in charge and forgetting, of course, that the Holy Spirit is the one who is really in charge of the church. Do we trust that the Spirit is present, that God draws near to us even today? Or do we put it upon ourselves? Do we make ourselves the one soul responsible? Do we make ourselves God in place of the Holy Spirit? This leads us to, to think about how the Holy Spirit functions in the church, how the Holy Spirit draws near to us, as I mentioned. Sensus fide is a, is a term that means the sense of faith. And what that means, basically, theologically, is that through baptism, every Christian has this capacity, this sense. Think of it as like a sixth sense, sight, hearing, touch, taste, right, smell, and add to that capacity for the divine. That each of us, by virtue of baptism, has this sense, this sense of faith, this ability to recognize the Spirit, and that God reveals God's self, God draws near to every baptized person. Why is that important? Well, it's important for two reasons, I would say. 
One is that when we think about what it means to be part of the church, to be part of the people of God, the faithful, the, the, the body of Christ, it means that no person is more, no baptized person is more Christian or more Catholic than anybody else. As I'm fond of saying, Pope Francis is not any more Christian or Catholic than the most newly baptized baby baptized in your parish. And that is what we believe. That's part of our church tradition. That is at the core of our faith. And so Pope Francis has this census fide. The most newly baptized baby has this census fide. All of us on this Zoom call do as well. This capacity for the divine, this capacity to recognize and to encounter and receive the gift of God's self as spirit and grace. This term census fidelium is the sense of the faithful. And that's where you have this group of, of people pictured here on the PowerPoint to illustrate that the whole of the church because of this census fide, this capacity that all the baptized have, have an ability collectively to recognize God's gift of revelation so that we receive what is taught, of course, through the tradition and through scripture that's passed on to us. But we are not kind of passive recipients. We're not just kind of blank slates. We are actively involved in the gift of God's relationship to the church and to the world. And so it's not simply the Pope by virtue of being the Bishop of Rome or Father Dan Haran by virtue of being ordained a priest or pick, pick somebody else. We don't have special kind of access to the divine. Even if our life is one of ministry, ministering on behalf of God and with our sisters and brothers in the church, nevertheless, all the baptized have this capacity for the spirit. And I think too often we forget that. We forget that when certain church leaders, whether that's at the local level, whether that's at a diocesan or national or international level, whether that's in our own family lives, when we think that one person has more access to, to the divine or to revelation or to God or to grace than another. And I think we forget that we do this together. Again, I go back to that opening line from Lumen Gentium, that all the faithful, all the baptized scattered throughout the world as they are, are united to one another in communion through the Holy Spirit. But do we believe it? Do our actions reflect that this is a, a core truth of our faith? That's the question. That's the seeing. That's my invitation to us is, is to maybe to look at ourselves in these last days of Lent, to look at our local faith communities and our churches and say, you know, do we actually act and put into practice and believe what it is we say we believe? Or is it just an idea? And if it's an idea, is it a forgotten idea, that forgotten member of the Trinity? So I want to talk about judging or interpreting. And, and in this framework, I want to talk about getting to know the Holy Spirit a little bit. Because if my intuition is correct, if my, my suspicion is true, that there are many unwitting or unintended Holy Spirit atheists, that people forget the Spirit, if not intentionally, they're not rejecting the Holy Spirit, but they just forget the Holy Spirit. Then maybe what we need to do is draw from that principle of what, what it is we say we believe and, and take a look at how we can think better about and actualize this aspect of our faith. So I, I mentioned earlier that the spirit is sort of difficult to wrap our heads around, which explains in part why there may be so many unwitting Holy Spirit atheists. Um, here are just a couple illustrations of various theologians and pastors who have written about the Holy Spirit going all the way back to 1957, for instance, um, I love this line. In an, in an academic article, a theology article published in 1957, Professor George Sirks described the Holy Spirit as the Cinderella of theology, kind of always there ready to be present, but not, not recognized, right? The story of Cinderella. Although I have to say, if, if the Holy Spirit's a Cinderella, I don't know who the evil stepsisters are, right? That's, that's an open question, maybe. We can, we can leave to uh, the fairy tale experts. But this idea that Cinderella is the one kind of left to the side, who's present already, but not recognized, right? So what, what is that invitation that requires um, the Holy Spirit to come to the ball, as it were, and to be seen by the people gathered around to recognize the Spirit as the Spirit actually is? Professor Elizabeth Johnson, um, an emerita professor um, uh, and a sister of uh, the community of St. Joseph, who taught at Fordham University for many decades, she wrote at one point, she says, while the son has appeared in human form, right, Jesus Christ, and while we can at least make a mental image of the father, the spirit is not graphic and remains theologically the most mysterious of the three divine persons. So I think, you know, she summarizes well what I've often come to discover, which is it's really easy to imagine God the father, God the creator, God as mother, right? 
God is beyond gender. God is beyond our human conception. And so when we talk about God creator, we, you know, we can use the language of father or parent or mother um, as we can use God is a rock, right? God is our strength. God is a king. God is a shepherd. God is many, many descriptors. Um, but whatever we imagine, there are these metaphors that are oftentimes applied to God creator, father probably being the most common. That's somewhat easy for us to wrap our heads around. And then we see, of course, the word made flesh. The second person of the Trinity becomes human, enters the world as one of us. And so that's very easy to imagine, maybe the easiest. But what do we do with the Holy Spirit? <laughs> we'll get to that in just a moment as well. And then, of course, um, a Protestant pastor named Francis Chan wrote a book in 2009. And I love the title. He says re the title of it's called Remembering the Forgotten God. And it's all about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit falls off too many Christians' radars. This isn't just a Catholic problem, in other words. So how do we get to know the Holy Spirit? How do we get to judge or interpret to, to sense the Spirit? I think the first thing is we need to be attuned to the Holy Spirit, right? And I think these points that were raised earlier about how, you know, whether we describe the Holy Spirit as Cinderella or most mysterious or you know, even forgotten, part of what that alludes, you know, what that points to is the fact that the spirit requires an additional kind of mode for us believers to attend to. An attunement that is focusing our attention, being present to the to the to the gift of God's self near to us, as Augustine said, closer to us than we are to ourselves, requires attention, requires attunement. I think about this in some ways, um, like any sort of instrument one would use to detect something. So think of like a metal detector, you know, if you're on the beach or something and you're, you're checking for metal or, you know, at the TSA line at the airport, right? If, if that metal detector isn't tuned up, isn't set exactly right to sense what it is intending to sense, then it's either going to be overly sensitive and, and get lost in the kind of chaos, or it's going to miss what it's looking for altogether. And I want to draw from the wisdom of uh, Professor Nancy Panina Madrid, um, who a number of years ago was the Mataliva lecturer here at um, St. Mary's College uh, at the Center for Spirituality and is a professor out at Loyola Marymount University in California. And Father Richard Lanon, who's a professor at Boston College, they wrote a book a number of years ago with a collection of essays on the Holy Spirit. And in, in their introduction, they talked about this issue of attunement, this need that we have to connect with the Holy Spirit to get ourselves ready for recognizing God. They write, the Holy Spirit meets us where we are. I just want to pause there for a moment because I think that's something distinctive. Even though God as Spirit, God as Word made flesh, present especially sacramentally in the Eucharist, and God creator is always present to creation, to the world, to us, I think sometimes we think we have to go somewhere to meet God. You know, we need to go to the church. We need to go to Eucharistic adoration. We need to go to a special place. And, and I think it's important that Professor Panina Madrid and Father Lenan begin by saying, the spirit is already here, right? The wisdom of St. Augustine, God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. Do we believe it? So the Holy Spirit meets us where we are in our experiences of joy and serenity, in our experiences of guilt and distress, wonder and awe, pain and anger. The spirit is present. I love that. I mean, that's that's a line that's worth reflecting on and contemplating, um, especially when we need to attune ourselves to God's presence among us. God doesn't just draw near to us when we go to God, nor does God just draw near to us in the happy times, the good times, but God is with us always in our pain, in our anger, in our wonder, in our awe, in our joy, and in our distress. They continue, the spirit remains present in all that comprises our life's journey, and here they quote St. Augustine, closer to us than we are to ourselves and is the source of strength for our inner being, quoting St. Paul. What is more, the Spirit continually invites greater life, animating our present. The Holy Spirit indwells our bodies and makes our very lives and living possible, empowering us with the grace of Christ. In being with us, the Holy Spirit is and remains sympathetic to our life situation and circumstances. And for our part, and this is where that attunement comes in, for our part, we, like the prophet Elijah, need to learn how to pay attention, to deepen our awareness of the Spirit's presence. 
for those who may not be remembering the second, the book of Kings, that line about the prophet Elijah is an allusion to when the prophet was in a cave. You can look this up. The, the exact passage escapes me right now. But famously, the prophet Elijah was told, received this message to go to this cave and await the presence of God. God as spirit was coming, right? In Hebrew at that time, the language would have been Ruach Elohim, the breath or spirit of God, who was going to meet Elijah and inspire Elijah on the next step of being God's prophet to God's people. And so famously, Elijah's in this cave kind of hanging out, waiting for God to show up. And have you ever been in that situation before? You Maybe you're the first to get to a restaurant or you're kind of waiting in a parking lot for somebody and you're going, where are they? Where are they? And worse, you've never seen them before. What do they look like? I don't know. What car are they driving? Who is this person? It's very awkward. You're sitting there getting stressed out. We imagine Elijah in this cave in the same boat. And at first, there is a great wind. There's a kind of like a storm. And, and, the, and, the, and the, the scripture tells us that God was not in that wind, that loud wind and storm. And then there was thunder and there was lightning and there was all this commotion and God was not present there either. And then we hear that there was a quiet silence and God was present. And Elijah steps out and recognizes God's presence in the silence. So this spirit, the, the, the spirit's presence does not always come to us in the loud and kind of noisy and in predictable ways we might expect God to appear. But as Panina Madrid and Lenan remind us, as drawing again from St. Augustine and St. Paul, the spirit is the one who is already here. So the attunement is necessary. We don't have to go out to find God. God is already drawing near to us. Are we seeing God here already? Or are we too distracted looking elsewhere, looking outward. I think that's really important. That is a key takeaway that God is always already present. God is always already near to us. I love this scene of the hustle and bustle of city life. Um, this is not a picture of, of downtown Pittsburgh, but you might imagine during rush hour tomorrow morning that there's going to be, you know, it'd be difficult perhaps to recognize God's presence in that, uh, in, as the Hebrew says in the book of Genesis, that tohu va bohu. I love that word. It just means the chaos and disorder, the kind of craziness of life. Sometimes we need to step back to recalibrate, to reattune ourselves to God as spirit already present. I love this line as well from the theologian Clark Pinnock. He says, for all theological topics, the spirit is one of the most elusive. Again, he's building on what we've seen already. It's really hard. Even theologians tend to avoid talking about the Holy Spirit. It becomes kind of tricky. But then Pinnock says, knowing the spirit is experiential. That's where the judging of this stage of see, judge, act comes in. We need to attune ourselves to look to see, to recognize, to experience God. It's not enough to theorize God, to think or imagine about God, to read about God. The Spirit is drawing near to us always already at this moment at all times. And so we experience the presence of God in our lives. Do we recognize that in the moment? He goes on and says, and the topic is oriented toward transformation, not information. If we think that the Christian life and the role of the Holy Spirit is about getting to know things better or more, then we're missing the boat. It's about getting to experience, getting to know God, getting to know God in relationship, and that relationship spilling over into all the relationships in our life. But do we believe that? Do we set aside time? Do we attune our sensors to that census fide? Do we recognize the God who is closer to us than we are to ourselves? One of the things that um, I, I reflect on, and I wrote about this as well, I mentioned earlier that God is beyond gender. God is beyond any human category. God is God. Everything that exists in the universe comes from God. And as St. Irenaeus in the second century says, will return to God. That's what we call salvation. All of creation comes from God and comes back to God. So God is the source of all life um, and, and is, is more than any human category that we have. And yet we are limited by our humanity and our human categories. We only have our language. We only have our experiences as embodied finite creatures to refer to God, to describe God. And so, you know, that's where we use language, language of our upbringing, like Jesus, who uses an intimate kind of short term, the, the Aramaic is Abba, to refer to God, right? It's oftentimes transliterated as like daddy or papa in English, right? This idea of an intimacy, a, par a parental connection. And for Jesus, that was the, 
the socialized and, and kind of enculturated image for God that was most intimate and uh, most affirming for him at the time. We know, obviously, the word made flesh as the, the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, right, our Lord and Savior. So that's very easy to recognize gender categories, for instance, for God as, as incarnate. The Holy Spirit's a bit more complicated, and, we, and I want to acknowledge that for a minute. The Holy Spirit is like all, like God, generally speaking, is beyond, uh, again, any human conception that we have. Those are only approximations. They're only metaphors or analogies to point to uh, the, the incomprehensible mystery of the divine that we can never fully grasp. And yet the language in both Hebrew and the earlier Syriac and even um, the, the kind of Greek translations in the New Testament that go back to the Hebrew origins are not distinctively male references. So I mentioned earlier, Ruach Elohim, right? The breath or spirit of God that we see at the beginning of Genesis 1 that appears again and again and again throughout the Torah, throughout the prophets, um, into the wisdom literature especially, is actually a feminine word, right? And so Numa as well, right? It's not until we get into the Latin where we have a Latinized word, spiritus, right, it, that, that is the source of our English word spirit, that the word itself, because of the way that those languages use gender around nouns and pronouns, um, that we can use this kind of reference to, to maleness. All of this is to say simply this, that I believe like a lot of the early Christian theologians, um, like those scripture scholars who study the sources of divine imminence in the Old Testament through Paul's writings um, as well, that, that it's okay to refer to the Holy Spirit, not just as it or spirit, but she with a capital S would be fully appropriate. And I, and I say that because I think some people find that maybe um, off-putting or they had never considered it before. Um, and I invite you, if you're somebody for whom that seems surprising, to ask yourself, why is that surprising? For God who creates all that exists and sustains everything that is, and that every baptized man, woman, and child is, you know, in relationship to this God who is always already drawing near to us, uniting us in the spirit, why not use that language? So I'm just going to leave that there. That's one aspect of coming to know, getting to recognize and how we refer to the Holy Spirit. You will see this in, in lots of, if you want to learn more about the Holy Spirit, you'll see this often in, in literature. Um, and I can say more about that maybe in the Q&A if folks have questions. But I also want to talk about metaphors for the Spirit, because I believe that as, as Sister Elizabeth Johnson um, and others have pointed out, that the spirit is elusive or people are unwitting Holy Spirit atheists because it's really hard to wrap our heads around the spirit. The first two of these images, I think, are the most common. Um, in the Synoptic Gospels, when Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan, um, we have this image, right, of the spirit appearing like a bird. That's all it says. It doesn't actually say dove, but we've kind of assumed, I think, in the last couple centuries that dove is really what's going on. And so you see these banners and Every confirmation class has, you know, doves everywhere on the decorations, and, and that's fine. That's, that's okay. But it's really hard to pray to a dove when you're looking for, you know, relationship with God, right? The same thing with um, flame, a flame of fire. And, and there's, this is a beautiful image that, has, that goes all the way back um, to, the, to the early Jewish traditions of recognizing God's presence. So, you, you know, when we see the flame as a symbol of the divine, we can think, for instance, of Moses in uh, the book of Exodus chapter three with the burning bush, right? Or we see a little bit later in the Exodus experience, the, the tornado, the kind of whirlwind of fire that appears to protect um, the Israelites as they're leaving uh, the confines, the slavery of Egypt to hold back the chariots and charioteers. Um, and that's just a little preview again for the reading from Exodus at the Easter vigil, if you go to the vigil, right? Um, you know, I, as a little side note, it always kind of, it makes me laugh and, and kind of shake my head when we have that whole psalm response to the passage from Exodus, and we're basically cheering about all these Egyptians drowning in the Red Sea, but that's for another time. In any event, we see as well in the Acts of the Apostles, right, at that in the great feast of Pentecost, the image, the metaphor that's used is that God as spirit appears to the apostles and to those disciples in the upper room as like tongues of fire above their head. They're not literal fire, I hope. Or maybe maybe they are, and they end up with hair like me. You know, it just burns it all off. But but th these are symbols. These are signs of of transcendence of of of, of God's presence. 
And I've not long ago, um, you know, used one, proposed another metaphor, and I just share it with you this evening. This is, you know, this is from me, and it's, 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 I'm not the only one to think this way, but I, I've often thought of music, in particular jazz music, as a great symbol uh, or metaphor for how the spirit works in the world. So when we think about getting to know the spirit, if you're a fan of jazz music or improv improv improvisational music at all, um, or if you're a musician yourself, you know that there's a way in which you can be very, you know, rigidly um, sticking with a, a composition, right? And you can you can play or orchestral sort of compositions with others. Um, and, and it's beautiful and it's wonderful, but there's another form of creativity that exists when musicians are within a framework, right? Maybe they start off in a key together with a basic melody and that there are times in which there is a not predetermined path or pattern that the musicians in their respective instruments or vocals will take. And what is created is original and it's beautiful and it's compelling and it's inspiring. And what I've often thought about is somebody who's a very mediocre musician. I, I'm a pianist and, and I've played uh, percussion in, in, in orchestras and in bands before, but I'm not really, I'm no jazz musician. I'll say it that, that from the outset, but nevertheless, in the little ways in which I've experienced playing music in an improv setting with others, there's something present there. And I think back to that line from Lumen Gentium, paragraph 13. It is a form of communion, of relationship, where the spirit, I believe, is what is uniting all of us. And when you're open to that as a musician in that setting, as jazz musicians often are, there is no need to speak and plan in advance. There's an openness to God's cre creative action in your life in a really tangible, very powerful way. There are so many other ways in which people can think about how the spirit is functioning in their lives. The question is, are we attuned to it? Are we exercising that sensus fide, that capacity for the divine? Or are we just not paying attention? Are we just unwittingly, maybe even not believing what it is when we gather at mass, we proclaim we believe? So the last thing I want to say is um, very, very short. And this is because the action part of this is really an invitation to all of us through discernment, through reflection, through prayer to move you know, to reflect on the spirit, to see these resources, to get to know the spirit better, and then to see where is God leading us. Um, I've also reflected, I wrote about this, I think Mary Lou may have mentioned this in talking about the NCR columns. Um, right at the beginning of Lent, I, I talked a bit about um, the first Sunday of Lent's reading, right? Every first Sunday of Lent, the gospel is one of the versions from Matthew, Mark, or Luke of Jesus going into the desert, right? We all know this story. He's tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. He encounters um, the tempter, right? The great tempter, Satan, um, has this exchange um, and then comes back, right? It's a time of prayer, of fasting, of preparation for his public ministry. And when Jesus comes back, I love Luke's version of this. He comes back, he goes right to church because he was on the lecture schedule and he knew he had to get there. He had to read and they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he says, what is proclaimed here is fulfilled in your hearing and it's off to the races, right? It's nonstop until we get to Holy Week. But it's interesting that of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew and Luke describe what happens after Jesus's baptism one way. And Mark describes it another way, and it's a very subtle way. Are we attuned to hearing this? This is an invitation when we're at Mass to listen to the gospel. What I mean by this is Matthew and Luke say that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert where he fasted and prayed for 40 days and confronted these temptations. But Mark says, after he's baptized in the Jordan, the Spirit drives Jesus into the desert. And it's really powerful. It's very striking. It's easy to miss because if we zone out, as happens sometimes at mass, right? You hear the beginning of the gospel and you go, oh, I know this one. And then you kind of like think about what are we going to have for lunch and how busy is the parking lot going to be? And what are we going to do? Then the priest or the deacon says the gospel of the Lord, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And we sit down and you go, what was that about? I got to hear the homily. What, what, what did we just hear proclaimed? But that little difference, I think, is really significant when we think about how the spirit works in the world. And how Jesus, as fully human, as he was fully divine, who really genuinely, not pretended, but really fasted and prayed and struggled with temptation. What is going on here? In Luke and Matthew, the idea that the Spirit leads Jesus suggests that Jesus was willing, 
that he was on board with the, the plan to go into this place of discomfort, this place of challenge and temptation, that he knew that was part of God's will. In Mark's gospel, the fact that the spirit doesn't lead Jesus as if by the hand, oh, come follow me, hold my hand, I'm going to lead you to where you need to go. Instead, the spirit has to push Jesus into the desert drives Jesus into the desert, into a place that is scary, uncertain, full of danger, full of temptation, where he's going to be uncomfortable, where he's going to pray and discern and struggle. What I love about that is is a couple things. One is that I believe the Spirit does both things all the time. If we're attuned to God's call in our life, then maybe we will be open to letting the Spirit lead us even into places we may not want to go. But if we are resistant, God is still working in our lives. And sometimes the Spirit has to push us, has to drive us into that metaphorical desert, that place of discernment, that place of confrontation, that place of prayer, that place of consideration of what is it that God is asking of me. The interesting thing, too, historically, I'm going to be a little bit of a nerd here for a minute, is that of the four Gospels, Mark is the oldest. It's the closest in its redacted, in its, in its kind of form that we have passed on to us over 2,000 years, what we know today, from the oral tradition to the written tradition, it is the first to be written down. And what I love about that is that the earliest Christians who themselves may be struggling with what it means to encounter God as human, and what does it mean to discern the Spirit's role in this early Christian community, they describe Jesus' experience after baptism as needing to be pushed The Spirit had to drive Jesus into that place. And I also think, it's purely hypothetical at this point, but that Matthew and Luke, who had access to Mark's gospel, but also filled it out with additional oral tradition from those who knew Jesus in the the generations that preceded uh, Matthew and Luke, that they tamed it a little bit. They said, ooh, this is kind of embarrassing. Maybe the Spirit leads Jesus. That's He's Jesus after all, right? But I think what I like about Mark's version is that some of us are in a place where we need to be driven or pushed. Some of us are open to the spirit and can be led as well into God's will. Both of those are actions of the Holy Spirit. So the the last thing um, I want to say before um, closing here and and engaging in in some discussion, if we have time, I hope we do. I'm sorry. I I think I may be going a bit long, Um, but this will be very brief, is, is to talk about synodality. Right now, the church is in a process of synodality, of walking together, of discerning together. And Pope Francis, this has been a key, kind of a, a central point of his ministry as Pope, as Bishop of Rome. And it's not something he's invented. This goes back to the early, early centuries of Christianity, these synods and councils that took place. And what it was, was the Christian community coming together, listening to one another, walking together, accompanying one another, one another by the Spirit, through the Spirit, to discern what it is God is calling the church to be and to do. Pope Francis has lifted this up for us in these years, saying that it's not just the Pope and the bishops and cardinals and priests and sisters and lay ministers, but all the baptized (coughs) who have this census fide. And he says, we need to listen to one another because all of us have this capacity for the divine. The Holy Spirit draws near to every one of us, indwells each and every one of us. It is the gift we receive at baptism. And so by engaging in this synodal process, we are actually celebrating a key element of our faith tradition, that census fidelium, that we as a whole body of Christ, all those scattered throughout the world, united to one another in communion by the Spirit, we are the church, as St. Paul says. We are the people of God, as the council proclaims. And so we do this together. It's not a passivity. It's not a, we sit here and wait for whatever Pope Francis or the local bishop or whoever decides. It is the spirit who works through the whole of the body of Christ. So I just want to say that I think some people, including some church leaders, have been maybe a little resistant to Pope Francis's invitation, that call to synodality. But they may be in a position where the spirit needs to drive them there right? To push them into it. The question I have is, do each of us, are we participating? Are we involved? Are we open to the Spirit leading us into this conversation of walking together and listening to one another? So let me just close my my formal remarks here with with, um, 
with a prayer. Um, it's a take on a very traditional prayer to the Holy Spirit. So I invite us to attune ourselves to the presence of God who is closer to each of us than we are to ourselves. That scattered as we are throughout the world, yet connected by Zoom, we are more connected by the gift of God's Spirit in communion with one another. And we pray, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them, kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we, they shall be created and you will renew the face of the earth. O God, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful. In the same spirit, help us to relish what is right and always rejoice in your consolation. And in all things, in this too, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So I thank you for your time and, and for your attention. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, turn it over to Dr. Fisher, who is going to grill me now for the next 15 minutes or so with hard questions, I have no doubt. Brother Dan, that was terrific. You've given us so many insights and so much to reflect on. It's a lot to absorb, and I'm sure we'll think more about this as time goes on. There were a lot of questions and comments in chat. Uh, we won't have time to cover them all. Um, uh, there were a number about the concept of attunement. Uh, I'd not really heard that term myself before. Um, uh, interestingly, having been a product of Notre Dame and uh, kids who've been at Notre Dame and Nora at Notre Dame, Father Hesburgh always said his favorite prayer was come Holy Spirit. And I heard him say that many, many times. And it sort of relates, I think, to your concept of attunement. But there were a number of questions or comments around this. And one I liked was, how do we do this as a parish? And maybe synodality is part of that. But, you know, is this an individual process of attunement or it is a group process? That's such a great question. And and I love uh, I love that Father Hesburgh, that that was his favorite prayer. It's mine too. I, if I may, before I get to that question about the individual and, and the parish level, um, just share with, with all of you folks that um, it just so happened that two weeks ago, I was in Rome, Italy, and happened to be in the Sistine Chapel uh, on, I think it was on Wednesday afternoon or Tuesday afternoon. And the thing that came to mind there was exactly that prayer that was that was so near and dear to Father Ted Hesburgh and um, and to so many, which is when there's a conclave, which means you know to lock the door. They lock the cardinals in the Sistine Chapel to elect the new bishop of Rome. The prayer that is sung, is chanted as they come in, is "Veni Sancte Spiritus," "Come Holy Spirit," "Come Holy Spirit." And so it's a short prayer, and maybe that's a good segue back to your to the great question you you asked me which is where does it begin? Um, it is, it, we, we in the Catholic tradition, we are a both and people. We're not either or, right? Jesus is both human and divine. Um, uh, we are both body and spirit, right? And so I think it is both an individual and a collective um, process. And so to attune ourselves, I, I think one way I think about this to extend this sort of musical metaphor is to think of a symphony, is to think of, you know, an orchestra and maybe to mix the metaphor a bit, who is the conductor but God, right? God, perhaps as spirit and what syncs the orchestra together? Well, that's the spirit as well, right? Conducting, bringing together, making sure everybody's playing in right time and in the right key and at the right pace and at the right moment. But we have, we do that together. And we have to be accountable to one another, right? Responsible for each other, to hold each other um, up to that task. And I think that's where the parish comes in, right? We come together to worship on Sunday, not as individuals, but as a community of faith nourished uh, by God's spirit and by the Eucharist to go back into the world, right? But it's also interesting that when an orchestra is, is preparing to perform a piece, they have to tune their instruments, and so the concert master, the first violinist will play the, the A note, right? The, the famous concert A. And all the other instruments will match up and sync up with that, uh, with, that, with that note. 
And I think that is, is, the, is an image I like in response to this question, that we do this together, but we have an individual responsibility too, right? We have to tune our instrument, that census fide, that capacity for God that we have at baptism. So that means paying attention. That means taking time, taking some quiet time, perhaps. It means thinking in new ways, even in the hustle or bustle of, of the commute to work or the busy downtown or, gosh, you know, the last thing you want to do, especially like the week before Christmas is go to a, like a shopping mall, right? You have to pick something up and it's just a, it's just total chaos. Is there a way in which you can enter into that to tune your instrument, to attune oneself to say, when I get into this space, can I ask the question, where is God here? And I think that's the individual thing that contributes to the larger kind of communal process. Um, and I think it, it manifests itself at the parish level in lots of ways. But if we don't kind of have our instrument tuned, when we come together as a parish, somebody's going to be out of sync. It's going to sound odd. You know, everyone else is playing B flat and somebody over here is playing a C sharp and it's not going to sound good. And so that's how we do it together. But we have an individual responsibility in our day, daily lives, and really at every moment that we're able to, say, to ask ourselves, where is God here? And to recognize that, that God is already with us. Father Joe had a number of comments, and um, uh, one was uh, he was thanking you for your presentation and said the Catholic charismatic renewal has been tremendously blessed by being able to acquire the historic site of the Duquesne weekend and reclaim the Ark and the Dove. The vision of the Catholic charismatic renewal is to foster unity, all in caps, and to extend the grace of baptism in the Holy Spirit to all generations. And I'm, I'm happy to respond to that because I think, you know, um, especially in the Catholic tradition, especially in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, the charismatic renewal was was one of the few places where where the Holy Spirit did get front and center attention. Right. And um, and so I don't think many folks who found themselves in in the charismatic renewal prayer groups and um, liturgies that are celebrated in various parishes um, necessarily. Uh, would fall as victim to the Holy Spirit atheism I was talking about earlier, right? But at the same time, um, we are a big tent church in which there are many forms of, of prayer and styles of worship and devotion. And not everybody feels drawn, for instance, to the Catholic charismatic renewal um, in that style of prayer and worship. So um, so I think that is, it's a great avenue. Um, and one, and I appreciate Father Joe making the point that, you know, there are a number of symbols, um, biblical symbols and, and other metaphors that that have been useful in the charismatic renewal communities, um, prayer and worship and reflection and personal devotion. Um, and I love that point about the foster unity uh, uh, to, to all generations. That's exactly right. I mean, that is what we say when we say that the spirit is, um, or what the council says when we talk about church, that the spirit's the one who unites us scattered as we are throughout the world. There's so much more to say too. I mean, I'm just thinking about what I could have, you know, we could have had 10 weeks of, of presentations on the Holy Spirit. Um, we haven't even talked about the, the traditional gifts of the Holy Spirit um, that come to us from the prophetic tradition and wisdom literature of the Old Testament. We haven't really talked about the, the Holy Spirit in our in our Eucharist, in our, in our liturgy, right? The epiclesis, as it's called in Greek, the calling down of the Spirit. Lord, send your Spirit to make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration. That's the work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one um, who accomplishes the miracle of, of what we celebrate when we gather for Eucharist. So there's a lot there. Um, I, I kind of went off track there, but thank you for the, the shout out to the Charismatic Renewal. So there was a question about... Uh, um sort of contextualizing this talk. Is this part of a bigger project, an upcoming <laughs> book, uh, a series of 10 lectures? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, as, as Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan, uh, just because of the temptation to, to do that. I'll be honest with you. I, I am, um, I'm not currently working on a, a book on the Holy Spirit, but in my medium term interest, there is. There's a, a, a theologian colleague of mine um, who I've collaborated with on other projects before. And, and, and she and I have talked about working on an article about the Holy Spirit, um, maybe in the next couple of years. Um, I, I'll, I'll confess to you, all, I'm in the middle of several book projects right now. And so uh, I'm, I'm trying to get those done. And once those are done, um, I'll pray, come Holy Spirit, you know, and maybe that's that's the next path. But um, I hope it was evident in our in our conversation, in my remarks tonight, that you know, that I'm very passionate about this. And I think people people are hungering for this. I think it's an opportune time 
as the church is involved in this synodality process, because the, the whole kind of premise, the foundation of synodality is the belief that all the baptized have this sense of faith, this census fide, that we all have this capacity to recognize the presence of God in our life and world. That's perhaps a great way to end it. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, Thank you, Don, very much. Well, Father Daniel, uh, this was, as I imagined it would be, an amazing inspirational insight into the Holy Spirit, uh, who after tonight, I doubt will ever be overlooked again. And I, I think I'll take with me your, I, I wrote down a few things. One is that the Holy Spirit is closer to us than we are to ourselves. I love that. And of course, I love the sensuous fide. Mm -hmm. But also the artwork in your presentation was stunning. Yeah. Stunning. And I thank you for I thank you for all of it. It's and when you are ready with the book, please promise you'll come back here or with any articles that you're writing. Please keep my email on your blotter and give us an update to that. And uh, I have one thing that you will enjoy uh, before uh, we close. Uh, I want to remind everybody to put April 21st on your calendar because uh, Deanna Witsoski, who is the jazz pianist composer that performed for us uh, the music of Meredith Williams last year that was sold out, sold out, sold out. She's coming back on the 21st of April. Of April. Uh, she and her trio will present an evening of sacred jazz on the altar of Sacred Heart Church. So you'll get more information about that, but I couldn't help but think about it because one of the articles that I read was yours about the orchestra and about jazz. And here she is, she's spectacular. She is a devout Catholic who it oozes through her music. So uh, if you're around on the 21st of April, drive over. <laughs> come on down. That's great. Yeah, That's great. I, I I know if I know if her her music um, because I believe if I'm if memory serves me I hope I'm not misattributing um, the person who brought her to my attention but I think it was Father Ron Rollheiser of all people the great spiritual writer and and professor of of theology the he's a missionary of oblate an oblate missionary of Mary Immaculate um, many of you know his writings and his books of what was his name again Father Ronald Rollheiser and I believe he gave me her CD once and so. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, she's terrific. And she's written a beautiful book on Mary Lou Williams wow. and her conversion, her music, her conversion. But she's a fabulous jazz pianist. So what a we'll, gift. We'll, yes, it is. So thank you, Father Horan, 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 Horan. <laughs> <laughs> to my Irish ancestors, too. Our oh, thanks again to you, to Monsignor, to Andy, to Don and Nora and to Father Joe, and to each of you for joining us and for your gracious support for sharing the light this season. And we invite you to let us know if you have a speaker or a topic that you'd like us to include in our far, fall and winter season. Thank you. Father, will you please give us your blessing and offer a prayer? This father or one of the others? Oh, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> Father. Yeah. All right. This father, yeah. So if I may, I'll, I'll close with a blessing that was very near and dear to St. Francis of Assisi's heart. It's uh, something that comes goes all the way back to the Old Testament. And um, in one of the few remnant, the extant writings we have of Francis in his own handwriting, he offered this blessing to his, uh, his friend and his fellow friar, Brother Leo. And it goes like this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May, his, may he shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with kindness and give you peace. And may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and keep us united in that spirit, scattered throughout the world as we are. And may you all go in peace. Thank you so much for the gift of allowing me to be with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. And have a blessed Holy Week and a happy Easter. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless. Bye -bye. Blessings, everyone.